Ministry of the Week is the Sunday School Teachers and the Sunday School Superintendent. And right now that position is, is vacant, the superintendent. So pl please pray for the right person to come and fill that, that much needed role. And that's a good ministry to highlight because that's one we're trying to get get going again. And also the Church Family of the, re of the Week is uh, Trevor and Nancy Taves who are serving at Prairie Bible College and they've just been there a couple years now but Daryl has informed me that Trevor's been asked to be a part of some of the leadership there, so he's been given a bit more responsibility and and things like that there. So that's 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 exciting news for them and another thing we could be praying for them about. And also before we go into a uh, into a prayer time, there's a little email here from Rob Cochran of the AGC, and it's involving one of our uh, AGC churches in BC. So I'm just going to read the email out to you. It's a good afternoon, everyone. I'm sure by now you've heard or seen on the news the raging fires in BC resulting from record extreme heat. The town of Leighton has literally been burned up with people having lost everything. Our church in Lillooet at this point is good. Fires are close by them, but they have not been evacuated. Relief efforts and displaced people are being sent to Merritt, the, prov the provincially designated city for the area. Initially, many supplies of food, etc., came to Lillooet, Lillooet, where there was more than enough on hand. One of the elders of our church in Lillooet has a business in Leighton that was burned to the ground, and they, and they were, they were evacuated on a moment's notice. Please pray for the following things in your churches this Sunday. And here's a list of prayers they have: pray for those who have lost loved ones as well as possessions and those who are yet unaccounted for. Pray that God might send rains to the area. This would immensely help the efforts of fire control. Pray for the town of Lillooet that God might spare it from fires. There are two main highways in and out of the town. It is nestled in the mountains. Leighton where the fire was and Lillooet where our church is, they're 65 kilometers apart. And also pray for Brad and Darlene Naylor, our pastor in Lillooet. Brad is attempting to contact the church enlighten to find out practical needs and how it might be able to help so that's that's a very practical thing we could pray for for our our, our sister church there in Leighton, or one of the many sister churches we have in the agc
Our scripture reading comes today from James chapter 1. So I'll give you a moment to get there. Again, that's James chapter 1, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 8. Here we are starting at verse 1 of chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of, Lord, uh, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let, but let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. I'm just going to take a quick moment in in prayer, and then Dylan's going to bring the message for us. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that that you that you brought Dylan here to to share it with us. And Lord, I just ask that you would you be blessing the words of his his mouth and lord i pray that you be opening our hearts to to receive whatever you have for us lord and we we trust that your that that your word affects us and changes us and grows us lord and we just want to to stand on that promise now and, we're, and lord we ask for the blessing that you have for us this morning we pray this in jesus name amen all right good morning <laughs> it's so weird seeing people like this yes thanks for honking Awesome. Wow, what a privilege it is to be here. Uh, it's been a while since I've been here. I'm really glad that I can be bringing the word to you. And uh, yeah, just pray for me as we're going through this. I'll pray for you guys as I'm going through it. And uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to go through James chapter 1 as Mark read for us. And I wanted to get through all of it, but... There's a lot in James chapter 1. I encourage you guys to read it on your own time. Um, we're going to read it. We're going to ask some questions as we read. And hopefully we'll get some answers to those questions. I trust the Lord will speak to each person here. Uh, and I encourage you, even now, if you don't have your Bibles open there, or your phones there, apps there, to James chapter 1. I encourage you to go there to James 1. I also encourage you guys to take notes. Maybe it's the teacher in me, uh, but I encourage you to take notes. Open something up on your phone. Maybe you have paper and pen, you're old school. Um, when you hear the Holy Spirit prompting your heart today, write down what he says so that you won't forget the lessons from today. I'm not saying you gotta write for the whole sermon. Um, it could be that the Holy Spirit's only got one sentence for you to write down today could be that he's got a lot more but we forget things easily so I encourage you to open a note on your phone take out a pen jot some things down when the Holy Spirit prompts you to do so all right so let's let's get into it then and I'm gonna start in verse 2 James 1 verse 2 it says consider it pure joy brothers and sisters whenever you face trials of many kinds I'm going to read it again. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. All right, so let's ask our first set of questions here. Questions that go through my mind. Really, James? What are you saying? Are you actually telling me to consider my most painful experiences in life as opportunities for joy? Do you know what you're talking about? Those are just some questions I have for James after reading that first or that second verse. Now the short answer to those questions is yes. Yes, he does know what he's talking about. Yes, he does. He is telling us to consider our toughest times as opportunities for joy. But let's take a look at a longer answer. So there are reasons to believe James knew exactly what he was talking about. So first, Depending on which source you look at, this book of James that we're, that we're in, uh, it's said to have been written between 49 AD and 100 AD. 
During this time, there were moments of intense persecution of Christians, one of which occurred during the reign of Emperor Nero, as I'm sure some of you are familiar. Uh, this emperor tortured Christians in horrible ways after blaming them for a disaster that some believe he caused. So if James was alive during this time, the writer of this book was alive during that time, he'd be very familiar with that. Secondly, second reason to think that James knew what he was talking about is that Christians had a difficult time in the Roman Empire in general because they were often associated with Jews who were viewed as rebellious troublemakers. And third reason to believe that James knew what he was talking about here is that it doesn't take long as a human being in this life to understand that the world is full of trouble, full of trials and heartbreak. Some say the writer of this book was James, the brother of Jesus, and if that is the case, then James himself would have had to endure incredible hardship seeing his brother crucified. So all of this to say, yes, James knew what he was saying when he wrote about considering trials as opportunities for joy. But let's ask a second set of questions right away then. Why? Why must I consider these trials as joy? So to answer this question, let's keep reading. Okay, it says right after that, right after James talks about considering trials as opportunities for pure joy, he says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. James is not saying here that we must find joy in the trials themselves, but rather we find joy in the results of those trials. We don't have to pretend to be happy during a difficult period of life, but we are instructed to have a positive outlook because of the results those difficult periods can bring. I can speak from experience that the most difficult moments in life have often resulted in learning major life lessons. I'm sure many here, if not everybody here, could say the same. So I'll just share a couple of personal examples. Uh, as many are aware, my sister passed away when she was 20 years old. This happened when I was in grade 12 at the time. And I've never understood why that had to happen the way it did. I can speculate on why I think it happened. But in the end, I don't really know. The bottom line is that God taught me lessons in the midst of that pain. He showed me that he is always here with us. He showed me that he understands my pain. He understands what I'm going through. He showed me that he loves us and that he works through his people to show his love to us. A more recent example uh, of difficult moments being opportunities for joy and being uh, opportunities to learn. A more recent example is of the process of getting my, my girlfriend at the time, now fiance, into Canada. So we met in January 2020 last year and with Jesus as our foundation we built a strong relationship with plans of one day getting married. She was working in Chicago at the time and in October of last year she had to move back to South Africa, where she's from, due to complications with her work visa. In November, so a month later, she filed her Canadian visitor visa so that she could legally come to Canada, so that we could get married and start our life together. The original wait time was eight to nine months, meaning she would only arrive in Canada in August of this year, August 2021. So imagine not being able to see a close loved one for that period of time. I'd consider that a trial, at least I sure did when it was happening. Under normal circumstances, we would have expected her here in December last year, one month of waiting. These of course were not normal circumstances, they still aren't normal circumstances. We decided to ask God to bring her here in February. We prayed all the time consistently and asking God for a miracle. Many of you were praying for us during that time as well and we are very, very thankful for your prayers. 
and continued prayers. On February 5th of this year, we received an email from the Canadian government stating that all of her paperwork had been approved and she could legally enter Canada. And she arrived here in March. So through that difficult time, God taught me more lessons. He taught me that he still does miracles. Technically, Michaela still shouldn't be here. He answers prayers. Sometimes, and I think it's very reasonable to think this way as the human beings that we are, sometimes it feels like he doesn't answer prayers. But this is a very tangible example, evidence in my life that he does in fact answer them. Another thing he taught me is that he keeps his promises. He never promised me a wife. He never promised me this exact scenario would play out the way that it has. But in his word, in Jeremiah 29 verses 12 to 14, he says that he hears us. He promises us that he hears us when we pray. Jeremiah 29, 12 to 14 says this, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. He also says this in Romans 8 verse, or sorry, well, God says this in Romans 8, 28. Paul was writing. Paul said in Romans 8, verse 28, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God keeps his promises. So to answer our questions here, the second set of questions we ask, why? Why should we consider our trials as joy? Or opportunities for joy? Because the testing of our faith produces perseverance, Perseverance helps to make us mature and complete followers of Christ. And when our faith is tested, God is giving us opportunities to learn from him. So let's continue with James 1. Let's move on to verse 5. In verse 5, James says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. So let's ask a third group of questions here. How do I get this wisdom that James is talking about? I know James says to simply ask for it, but that doesn't seem like enough. I often have doubt when I pray, and I don't want to be this double-minded person who can't expect to receive anything from the Lord. How do I not have doubt? How do I do what James is telling us to do here? Now, this may seem like a difficult set of questions to answer. In a sense, it is a bit of a mystery as to how we gain wisdom. It's not like we have some wisdom bank account and get notifications every time God makes a deposit into that account. It's far more abstract. But in another sense, it is quite simple. We ask and God gives. It is something he has promised us. Jesus says in John 14 verses 13 to 14, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Jesus said that. James is telling us here to talk to God. Ask Jesus for this wisdom in his name, and he will give it to you. Now, you may say to that, but Dylan, you're forgetting that I have doubts when I pray, so then I am automatically disqualified from receiving this wisdom according to James. How do I pray without doubt? Well, my answer to that is, is more prayer. Our Heavenly Father wants us to talk to Him. He desires relationship with us. He's a relational God. He is not distant. Satan would have you think that your prayers need to be perfect before bringing them to God. 
Satan would have you think that you're not good enough to talk to God, that you don't deserve anything from God, and you can't talk to him at all. Satan's lies are always clever because they are mixed with truth. Satan's lies are always clever because they are mixed with truth. As sinful human beings, we are not good enough to talk to God. We don't deserve anything from Him. But through the blood of Christ, our debt of sin has been wiped out. We've been brought into right relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. If you don't believe me, read John 3.16. You can see for yourself there. Another thing the Bible says is that we are in fact clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 17 to 21. And a third point here, we are encouraged as God's people to approach his holy throne with confidence. And you can read that in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. We can and should talk to God all the time. In your prayers, be honest. I've had to pray many times about wisdom and doubt because like any normal human being, any normal follower of Christ, doubt creeps in. Satan feeds you lies. It happens to each one of us. And we need to bring that to God in honest prayer. Many of my prayers have gone like this. God, I want to be wise. Please make me wise. Even now as I pray, I feel doubt in my heart. I don't want to doubt. I want to trust you. Please change my heart. Please give me a faith that is strong. Please help me to be unwavering in trusting you. I know you are sovereign. I know you are all-powerful and all-knowing. I know these things in my mind. Please help me to know and believe them in my heart, in my soul. I pray these things in Jesus' holy and powerful name. Amen. God is far more capable than we can possibly imagine. He can handle our fears, and he wants us to bring them to him. These last 18 months have been tiring and trying to many, if not all of us. There have been many difficulties in addition to those imposed on us by the government. There's been the loss of loved ones. There's been health scares. There's been failing health, relationship issues, etc. And what does Jesus say to all of that? Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. So to answer our questions, how do we receive wisdom and not doubt? We humbly approach God in honest prayer, asking Him to change our hearts. Now moving on to verses 9 to 11. We're going to get a little bit further than what Mark read for us. I wasn't sure how far we'd get. Verses 9 to 11 in James chapter 1 says, Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. Other translations will say poor believers there. Continuing on with what James says here, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with a scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. So our fourth group of questions here, what's James talking about? Is it better to be poor than wealthy? How does someone with less wealth have a high position? 
What does it mean for the rich to take pride in their humiliation? What's James on about here? So one commentary I read interpreted James's words this way. They said, Christianity brings a new dignity to the poor and not so influential people of this world. All believers share the distinction and dignity of being changed by the gospel and being charged with the mission of taking that same good news to the rest of the world. Believers know they have dignity before God because Christ died for them. Whatever our social or economic situation, James challenges us to see beyond it to our eternal advantages. What we can have in Jesus Christ outweighs anything in this life. Knowing him gives us our high position where we find our true dignity. This commentary continues. It says, the poor should be glad that riches mean nothing to God. Otherwise, these people would be considered unworthy. The rich should also be glad that wealth means nothing to God because wealth is easily lost. We find true wealth by developing our spiritual life, not our financial assets. God is interested in what is lasting, in what is eternal, our souls, not in what is temporary, our money and possessions. Now don't hear something James isn't saying here. He's not telling us to abandon money or to forget about being smart with what we have. It's not wrong to have possessions. It's not wrong to be wealthy. The Bible does not say that money is evil. It says that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Now, perhaps you have a different question in your mind. Perhaps word, uh, James's words on wealth here bring up the question, am I rich or am I poor? I looked up a bunch of statistics online about wealth in Canada and that sort of thing. But really, poor and rich are relative terms. And James is not looking to help us judge who is rich and who is poor. Rather, James is communicating that our wealth or lack thereof is something for which we should be thankful. If we belong to Christ, we have salvation. We have a message of eternal, priceless value to bring to others. Our identity, our lives, are not wrapped up in the material things we own. They are wrapped up in Christ. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21 and verse 24, Jesus said this about wealth. Do not store up treasure, sorry, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It could be that right now the Holy Spirit is working in your heart and you need to talk to your Father in Heaven about your finances. If you have many possessions or few, if you have a lot of financial stress or only a little, talk to God about the money that He has given you. Seek wisdom on how you should use it with the aim of bringing Him glory in everything you do. Listen to the Holy Spirit's conviction and act on it. There is much more that we could study here in James, uh, especially in James chapter 1 here, but I'd like to end our time together by asking a slightly different set of questions. So, set of questions number five. Why does any of this matter? Why should James's words here affect my life? How does this scripture connect to what is going on in the world right now? Why should the gospel create a sense of urgency in my life? Despite the current circumstances, the mission for Jesus' church, everybody here, whoops, 
everybody here, right? This mission has not changed. Jesus' mission for us has not changed. Regardless of political and economic instability, our purpose as followers of Christ, it hasn't changed. The Great Commission is still there as direct instruction from Jesus. Persecution of religion is on the rise in places like China. We are seeing more of that here in Canada than ever before, with pastors being imprisoned for continuing church services when the government told them not to. The foundation of our own nation here in Canada is being destroyed as evidenced by destructive rallies in major Canadian, city, major Canadian cities on Canada Day this year. The cause for general concern is high, and even now as I list all of that stuff, our anxieties may be rising. But Jesus is still on the throne. God is still in control. He remains sovereign over everything that is happening. The words in Psalm 2 seem particularly relevant to our situation today. The psalmist says, Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Jesus is coming back. It would seem that his return is more imminent than ever. Are we ready? Have we taken his word seriously? Are we taking it seriously? I'm going to read a lot from Matthew chapter 24 right now. So if you'd like to turn to Matthew 24 or go there on your app, I'm going to start in verse 4. I'm going to read verses 4 to 14. And then I'm going to skip down to verse 30 and read to the end. So Jesus in Matthew 24 here is talking about the end times. Matthew 24 verse 4, Jesus our Lord and Savior says, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming, I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Moving down to verse 30. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know 
that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why does all of this matter? Why does it matter that you're here today? Why is it important that we read and listen to the words of James? We could change that question to why is it important to read God's word? We need wisdom. We need to know how to approach each new day. And in order to do that, we need to know our God. He has revealed himself to us through his word. Do you want to live in fear or in love? Go to him and his word. The Bible says perfect love casts out fear. 1 John 4.18 Do you want anxiety or peace in your heart? Go to him and his word. The Bible says that his peace transcends all understanding and that his peace will guard your heart and your mind. That's in Philippians chapter 4 verse 7. A couple more words of encouragement for us before we leave here and carry on with our day. I'd like to read Romans 8:28 again where Paul says, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. In all things, all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And a last piece of scripture here, Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. May the Lord bless his word to each one here. Amen. Sing a song of worship. That Psalm 100 was an excellent uh, uh, prelude to the song that we're going to be singing all about how great a God we serve. So I would invite you to uh, get your song sheets and sing how great thou art with us.
a benediction for us, I have two pieces of scripture. Uh, The first is Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, the Great Commission. It says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And then the second scripture is from Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The Lord bless you this week and today.